Hey, you guys, you know what time it is. It's Flickers of Fear time. This is my movie review show. The movie that we're doing today, this is one that I actually saw a really long time ago, and I remember really liking it a lot. Um, so I specifically wanted to revisit it for this show. So the movie that I'm talking about is The Company of Wolves from 1984. Now, literally, the only thing that I remembered from this movie that was one, that it was about werewolves, and two, I remembered that very iconic scene with, uh, you know, the wedding party where all of the highly dressed and quaffed nobles turn on, turn into werewolves. I remembered that, and that was pretty much all I remember. And the fact that it was kind of like based on a fairy tale. So that's all I remembered of it. Uh, but yeah, so I was like really excited to watch it again, because honestly, I think this is one of the best werewolf movies ever made, even though, like I said, it's much more in a fairy tale type of vein than in maybe some more, you know, in a more horror type of vein. Even though this does have a lot of, like, gory shit in it, it's pretty bloody. It has, like, some pretty gross uh, transformation scenes, you know, severed body parts, things like that. So it's not like it's not a horror film. It's just much more like a fantasy, you know, fairy tale type of thing, rather than, you know, maybe your more traditional horror werewolf. So this movie was directed by... Neil Jordan, and, uh, you know, he's a British director, and I believe he started out as a novelist as well. This was actually his second movie. Uh, his first one, I think, was called Angel, which I think was kind of about the IRA or something like that. And Stephen Ray was in that. Now, Stephen Ray uh, is also in this film in a relatively small role, uh, because this is kind of, this story is almost, it's not like an anthology, but it does have, like, kind of story within a story within a story. There's, like, a whole bunch of different stories going on. Uh, inside it, which I'll kind of get into in a minute. Stephen Ray was also, uh, he would work with Neil Jordan a lot subsequently, uh, probably most famously in uh, The Crying Game uh, and Interview with the Vampire, uh, which Neil Jordan also directed. So this is kind of one of his earlier movies. Now, the idea for this and the story behind this came from the novelist Angela Carter, and she had written this short story anthology back in 1979 that was called The Bloody Chamber. And in it, she basically took fairy tale tropes or, you know, famous fairy tales and sort of, I don't know, like turned them on their heads or made them more like, I don't know, it made them more like Grimm's fairy tales or kind of like, you know, did something different with the genre. So this movie is kind of like Red Riding Hood, but then there's a bunch of other sort of famous fairy tale tropes, tor uh, you know, thrown in there as well. And the thing about this movie, too, is that it's really um, surreal. It reminds me a lot, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Labyrinth, which came out a couple of years after this, was really influenced by this film, because it really has the same kind of vibe uh, as Labyrinth, although Labyrinth was much more, I guess that was much more geared toward kids or tweens, and it was much more, like, lighthearted, uh, whereas this one is much more, as I said, like a horror movie, but it does have the same kind of look to it. It does have the same little bit of a fairy tale kind of feel to it. There's, like, some funny stuff in it, but it's mostly, like, pretty much a straight-up horror film. So you have, at the very beginning, which is, it's kind of odd, but at the very beginning, you have a modern-day setting, Right. So you have this family and uh, David Warner plays the dad. There's a lot of like, and Angela Lansbury is in this. There's like a lot of people that you will uh, recognize, like a lot of British actors, a lot of American actors, uh, you know, and so forth. This family live in this kind of big house out in the English countryside or wherever. And uh, I guess they have, it's the mom and the dad and they have two daughters. So I guess the older daughter, whose name is Alice, is kind of a bitch and she is kind of going upstairs to her sister's attic room, uh, telling her what a pest she is and why does she just get to lay around and blah, blah, blah. She's basically just busting her balls, right? Now, on the other side of the door, the younger sister, Rosaline, is sleeping. So pretty much the entire movie is framed as Rosaline's dream. So you kind of have like the modern day kind of setting and then she's sleeping. She's got her little cure poster and her little Duran Duran poster and various other things. It's so like I said, it reminded me very much of Labyrinth where she has kind of toys in the room and like things in the room that come into play like in her dream. Uh, also, I feel like there was kind of a cameo appearance by Robert the Doll. I just, 
did, didn't Robert the doll look kind of like a little sailor and shit like that? Because I'm pretty sure the doll in this looks just fucking like that. Because I was like watching the movie and I'm like, holy shit, Robert the doll's in this movie. I didn't realize. But uh, I'd have to go back and look at Robert the doll again. You know, the famous haunted doll that lives down in Key West. But I'm pretty sure it's the same doll. Like, you know what I mean? It's like not literally the same doll, but the same type of doll. That's what I mean. So because Rosaline's older sister is kind of being a douche, uh, in Rosaline's dream which takes place in sort of this magical, I guess it's 18th century, like this kind of mag magical fantasy. It looks kind of medieval, but it's actually like 18th century. Um, you know, in this sort of, you can tell it's a set, but it looks really cool. Like it looks really otherworldly and it really, really works with the fairy tale tone of the film. Like it's almost like, I don't want to say like hyper real, but it's like, like an alternate reality type of thing that's going on. And as I said, a lot of the things that are in Rosalie, uh, Rosaline's uh, room, like in real life, show up in the dream world. So like Robert the doll is like big, like a person size, which is a little freaky, gotta admit. Uh, you know, so some of the, she has like, oh, there's all these big mushrooms and there's all this other kind of stuff that's uh, in the dream world. So her sister Alice in the dream is running through these woods and gets eaten by wolves. Uh, you're led to assume, or gets killed by wolves anyway. Uh, it happens off screen, I guess. She's just like screaming and then a bunch of wolves come and uh, you're led to believe that she dies. At which time you see Rosaline like in her sleep going, <laughs> like she's like, ha, ha, ha. my bratty older sister got killed by wolves. Nice. But yeah, so the next uh, scene, we see the older sister who looks pretty good for being torn up by wolves. You know, she, she looks kind of regular. So they're putting her in this uh, coffin and, you know, saying goodbye to her. Yeah, the younger sister didn't seem all too upset about it. So because the parents who are played by the same people that are playing the parents in the modern day, you know, which makes sense, um, are kind of upset about losing one of their kids. Basically, Rosaline is like, well, you know, she's like, I'm going to go stay with uh, Granny. Now, Granny is played by Angela Lansbury. And Granny, for a long time when I was watching this movie, I could have sworn it's like, is she like a witch or something like that? I don't know. Because she comes across as as kindly like a grandma, but she also kind of comes across as like a little bit, she's kind of irreverent. Like she's kind of making fun of the priest all the time and she knows all this stuff. You know, I think they kind of list her as being like superstitious because she believes werewolves are, re are real, but in the context of the movie, werewolves are real. So she's not really being superstitious. She's just being like practical. You know what I mean? Like... Let's stay out of the woods because that's where the werewolves are. Because she's right, you know, that they do they do turn up later on, like spoiler alert. So Rosaline goes and stays with her grandma, at which point she tells her the first story. And like I said, it's not, I don't want to say it's like an anthology film, because it's not, but there are so so we're inside a dream, and then inside the dream, like several characters, it's usually granny, but not always, several characters tell stories about something to another character. So there's like stories within stories within stories, but it's not as complicated as that sounds, if that makes any sense. But it is a little bit, I guess, like an anthology. You could kind of see it that way. But all the stories have a similar theme and that theme kind of being that you can't trust the attractive stranger type of thing because uh, Granny's big thing is, you know, werewolves, uh, some of them are, are hairy on the inside, uh, so you should always look out for, so she's kind of warning Rosaline to watch out for dudes that are all slick and stuff, but also uh, that their eyebrows meet in the middle. Like, if you ever see a dude like that, then probably he's a werewolf and you should run the fuck away because he's going to eat you, so... Just remember that for later. So then the first story that Granny tells is the one with Stephen Ray in it. And so Stephen Ray marries this woman and they're about to, you know, do the nasty on the wedding night or whatever. And then you're led to, I mean, you're pretty clear that he's probably a werewolf, right? Because he's like, he's hanging out in the shadows or whatever. And she's like, hey, why don't you come over here and le let me see that? And, um, you know, because... It was a long time ago, and she probably never saw him naked before. I don't know. But uh, so he's like, oh, I have to go outside. Like, I got to pee. Let's say he doesn't say it like that. But he's like, yeah, I got to go outside. And you're like, yeah, he's going to go outside and wolf out. So then he goes outside and subsequently disappears. So at this point, his wife is, like, really upset. She looks out the door, and she sees, like, a shit ton of wolves. And then she's like, well, obviously, they ate him, right? She didn't, like, she doesn't jump to, oh, he's a werewolf. She's like, well, they ate him. And so she gets a, big, gets a posse and goes out looking for him. She finds some wolf, you know, footprints, but they don't find him. 
So she's like, well, shit. And she gets all upset. Now, I don't know how many years go by, but it's a long time. Like, years go by, right? Because by the time, you know, this thing happens, like, there's a whole... She has, like, a bunch of kids. So she marries someone else, as you would, um, because, you know, her last husband disappeared. And uh, she thinks he got killed by wolves. So she marries somebody else. She has three kids. She's sitting around in the village. And then all of a sudden, in walks her uh, ex-husband, Stephen Ray. And he's got big, long hair. And he's being a real dick, I gotta say. He just comes in and he's like, I'm starving. Like, give me some food and blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, hey, whose kids are these? And she's like, yo, like, you left. And then I married again. And he's like, well, these aren't my kids. And then she's like, you didn't even wait for me. You married a you whore and blah, blah, blah. And he starts, like, beating the crap out of her. I'm like... Wait, 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 wait. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that kind of thing. But so her new husband comes home, finds him like beating the crap out of his wife and kills the wolves. He like cuts the wolf's head off because he turns into like Stephen Ray turns into a werewolf. And it's actually like, a pretty cool uh, transformation scene. It's not like one that you see a lot. It's more like he's pulling his skin off and then there's he pulls all his skin off and then you can see like all the musculature underneath. And then, like, while he's all musculature looking, like, looking like Frank from Hellraiser, then, you know, the the muzzle comes out and all of that. So it's really kind of cool looking. I mean, it was 1984, so it's not going to look quite as seamless, um, you know, and this was kind of a lower budget film. I think it, you know, only cost a million or two to make. And uh, so it's not going to be up to the standard of some of the other uh, werewolf trends, you know, like American Werewolf in London or something like that. But it does look pretty cool, I gotta say. And it is, like, pretty bloody. So the the new husband cuts off uh, the werewolf's head and the, <laughs> the the head goes flying into the milk, I guess. It was like a like, cauldron full of milk or something. Then it turns back into the human head and uh, she's like, oh my god, he looks just like he did when, we, when I first married him or whatever. And then the new husband smacks the shit out of her. This poor girl just can't, like, fucking win. So, basically, Granny's story is just don't trust anybody. <laughs> I mean, any man you meet is probably a werewolf, so you're just safe for avoiding them, I guess, like, altogether. But, yeah, so there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on. Rosaline is being courted, I guess, by this dorky... Uh, kid who lives in the village also and I guess they've known each other a really long time I don't the kid doesn't even have a name because I think in the um credits he's just called amorous boy and he has like this really weird big like dorky poofy hair and he's a little bit smaller than her I mean I guess they're the same age but she seems older which I guess they do at that age but whatever but it, that's like kind of funny so he's like real dorky and she's like sort of having it but sort of not really because she says like oh all the boys in the village are clowns and stuff like that which they indeed do seem to be uh so you know you can see where that's gonna go in the end there's some really weird sequences in this too because there's one scene where he asks her to walk home from uh from church with him right so we're gonna like walk through the forest and uh it's gonna be like a little date or whatever and she's just like fine so he brings her flowers and everything so they're walking down the path and then she like kind of he tries to like mac on her and she runs away and then there's she finds like th there's a rainbow and then there's like at the end of the rainbow there's like this tree and she climbs up the tree and inside there's a big bird's nest and inside the bird's nest there's eggs obviously but there's also like a hand mirror which you see later on like in the modern day world like the girl from the 80s that's dreaming all of this uh presumably and then like the eggs hatch and there are like little bitty stone babies in there and i was just like so there's there's definitely a trace of like surrealism uh to this film which i thought was like really cool and i had completely I, well, I had mostly, like, forgotten about that. Like I said, I did remember the the scene with the wedding party, like, with everybody turning into werewolves and stuff. But I had forgotten about those little touches like that, like the eggs hatching and there being little babies in there and whatnot. So, as I said, it kind of goes along that way with sort of going off in these other little directions of, you know, stories and there being a werewolf loose in the village because during this time like when she goes up and finds the eggs and everything she's gone for a long time so amorous boy gets home before her and everybody's like freaking out because like hey what happened to rosaline like you were supposed to walk her home what the fuck and then he finds like one of his dad's cows has been like torn up by a wolf right so they're like oh shit you know now there's a wolf in the village and they don't think it's a werewolf they just think it's a regular wolf which this village they have a lot of uh, trouble with them like in the winter time 
So they go out hunting the wolf and they catch it in a trap and then they shoot it. And then David Warner cuts the hand or the paw off of the wolf and then brings it home. And he's like, yo, it was a wolf paw. When I cut this off, I swear, and now it's a hand. So there was that whole thing. So from that point forward, Rosaline, she tells her mom, it's almost kind of like the stories that other people tell to her. Like the stories that her granny tells her are mostly just, you know, stranger danger type stories. Like, you know, look out for dudes that you know, are all charming and shit, but then they have the thing with the eyebrows and you got to watch out for that shit. There's also a really weird story too. This, this was actually one of my favorite parts other than the wedding part, because that part's awesome. But I had forgotten about this scene and it's really cool. There's this one scene where, this is one of Granny's stories, where there's this boy who doesn't really figure into the story otherwise, but because she's just telling something that happened like a long time ago. There's this boy and he's out in the woods and he meets who we presume is the devil. Now the devil is Terrence Stamp in what I believe is a really sweet 1920s Rolls Royce. It's so cool. And he's just like all in a really nice suit and everything. And then also in the car with him is Rosaline, but she's wearing a blonde wig. You know what I mean? So Terrence Stamp, the devil, gives this kid this little green uh, vial of like some kind of potion or something and he rubs it on himself and then he wolfs out so that's another story that granny tells as well now the wedding party story is actually a story that rosaline tells to i think her mom because her stories are kind of more like bitches getting revenge type of things rather than hey here's some man that was a werewolf or was acting like a shithead or whatever because rosaline's character is a lot more kind of badass and she's like not really afraid of these men so she's just kind of like yeah i'm gonna get my own back on them so her story is about all of these upper class twits um you know with all of their finery and wigs and those beauty marks they all have drawn on and everything and they're having this big wedding banquet and this big massive tent. I mean, it's like really cool. I love the fucking design of that. And I love all the costumes and wigs and stuff. It's just fantastic looking. And what ends up happening is so this one guy is marrying this woman and they're all, you know, everyone's eating and being all aristocratic and whatnot. And then this woman who is kind of a lower caste woman, I guess, and she comes in and she's really, really pregnant. And the whole point of that story being that the dude, the groom, had knocked this woman up and then abandoned her. But it turned out, though, that she was a witch. And so she comes back to the wedding party and turns all of the wedding party into werewolves. And they all, and I love all the scenes, like all the dogs, like jumping over the table, like in all their little outfits and stuff. Now, they did use some real wolves uh, for this. But obviously they couldn't use that many wolves because it would be like dangerous and probably like super expensive. So a lot of the wolves are actually uh, like German shepherds and things like that. They're sort of, they dyed their fur to look more like wolves. Uh, but they it looks really good because there's a lot of scenes with like just, just big packs of these wolves or dogs or whatever like running through the woods and it looks really cool. So then like the pretty much the last probably 20, 30 minutes of the movie is basically a a kind of a retelling of Red Riding Hood. I mean, she has the red cloak that her granny made for her and she meets a stranger in the woods who, even though he says he's a huntsman, he's like super, super fancy pants. Like he's got all the fucking brocade and all that shit on. And uh, he has a compass and she wants it. So basically he's like, well, I, you know, the compass always tells me where I'm at so I don't get lost. It's like, and if you're going to your grandma's house, then... Uh, if I get there before you, because I'm going to not go on the path because she's supposed to stay on the path. That's kind of the whole rule. And uh, he's like, so I'm going to get there before you. If you win and if you win, then you can have the compass. But if I win and I get to your grandma's house first, then uh, you have to give me a kiss. So you know how that's going to go. Well, uh, it should surprise no one that even though in the actual fairy tale, the huntsman actually ends up saving uh, Red Riding Hood from the wolf, from the wolf. Uh, in this one, the huntsman actually is the wolf. So he gets there first, uh, and he, like, Granny pretty much immediately is just kind of like, hey, you're a werewolf, fuck you. And she uh, gets him a couple of times. She gets in a couple of good licks, but then he basically knocks her head off. <laughs> like, he just goes, bat, and her head just goes flying. And then her head 
like breaks against the fireplace mantle, I think it is. So like it was made of ceramic. But like I said, this is a dream. So they can get away with a lot of weird shit like in the dream imagery or whatever. So Rosaline shows up at the house and the huntsman, who now looks very, very wolfy, he's got like the yellow eyes and the big long hair is all out and everything. And he's sitting there going, yeah, I got here before you and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, hey, where's my grandma? Oh, you know, she's, uh, you know, around. And, uh, and then even after Rosaline has figured out that he's killed her grandma, she doesn't seem all that upset about it. She, I think she is kind of simultaneously attracted to him and also repulsed by him. So then there's this really weird thing where she ends up sort of accidentally shooting him and then kind of then shooting him on purpose. But then because he's wounded and he turns into a wolf and then the rest of his pack is outside, she's like, oh, I, I'm assuming because she because he's wounded now, she's like, oh, well, they're going to leave you behind. So she feels sorry for him. And then she tells this other story about a female werewolf. Um, so it's like this little naked woman that climbs out of the well and goes to the priest and the priest is nice to her and everything. Fun fact, uh, that little naked woman, the little werewolf woman, uh, is played by Danielle Dax. Uh, if you know anything about post-punk music or anything like that, you'll know who that is. I knew she looked familiar. <laughs> and then when I looked at the Wikipedia page, I'm like, ah, God, that's who she is. All right. But yeah, so that whole story was like, she comes and the priest is nice to her and and everything. But then she's like, man, I can't like, live in this world, you know, because people, blah, blah, blah. So she actually uh, goes back into the well, presumably down to hell or whatever. So after this, like after the, all of these stories are completed, we come back to the modern day. But then in the modern day, it looks like all the werewolves have kind of come out of the dream and are now in the real world because they come up, like they start busting in through the windows of Rosaline's modern day house and running up the stairs and like the house is kind of all uh, overgrown, like vines have grown on the inside and it's kind of all fucked up and everything. And so they they jump in and they kind of knock all our toys over and that's like pretty much the end of it. So it's a really, really cool surrealist. Like I said, don't expect it to be like a straightforward a werewolf movie. It's not like that at all. It's like a bunch of fairy tales sort of intertwined. Um, so it has that kind of feel to it. It's very much like it's like Terry, like a Terry Gilliam movie, or like I said, it's like Labyrinth, which came across, you know, came out a couple of years later. Um, you know, it has that kind of vibe to it, but a lot more gory, a lot more kind of sexual. There's nothing really overtly sexual about it, but you know, the themes behind it are kind of er themes of eroticism, themes of, you know, women's burgeoning sexuality, stuff like that. Like I said, it's not the first time it's been done in uh, werewolf movies, and indeed some werewolf movies that were done later uh, made that uh, comparison, like, pretty straightforwardly. Like, you know, Ginger Snaps, uh, for example, is the obvious example, uh, which came out in 2000 and, uh, you know, equated werewolfery with, with girls going through puberty. And this is essentially the same thing, although it's more of a sexual awakening type thing, because she knows that this dude that she meets in the woods is a werewolf. I, I mean, she's got to know that, right? And But she's still like, uh, you know, she's still kind of enthralled by him. And it's not like she can't help herself. It's just kind of like... I don't know, but it, it's almost kind of like she's owning that power or whatever, because all of her stories were sort of about maintaining power, not being afraid of them, like of being equal to them. And there's a couple lines kind of like that, one of which is spoken to her, spoken by her mother, which sort of tie into that whole theme of women also have a beast inside them. So, you know, so so there's like an equality in that way. So, you know, her taking and Rosaline taking that to heart and not being afraid of the wolves and sympathizing with it with them or even becoming one herself at some point but yeah this is a really really cool 1980s fantasy film that has some really cool like horror elements has some really weird like visual elements and i feel like it it gets talked about a lot i guess in cult film circles but you don't hear a lot of I don't hear like kind of a lot of mainstream horror channels or anything like that really talking about it. And I think that's kind of a shame because this is like a really, really good, it's kind of, it's real weird. Um, and it's very eighties, but that I don't say that in a bad way. That's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely cool. If you like interview with the vampire, uh, you know, and stuff that's it's the same director. So definitely check it out because you can kind of see, you know, where he was going, like the early kind of shit with this. And if you like anything to do with fairy tales or dark fairy tales or anything like that, then you'll probably really dig it. I actually just watched it on 
Tubi. Uh, at, as of this recording, it's on Tubi, at least in the US, for free. So if you haven't seen it and you want to go check it out, then uh, I would strongly advise doing so. And that will do it for this Flickers of Fear, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye!